Um, so I have to t uh, I have to begin every talk with a little bit of a caveat. Uh, the Internet Archive is a small uh, not-for-profit based in San Francisco, California. This is actually a photograph of our new headquarters building in the Richmond district, for those of you that are familiar with the city. It's kind of out toward the northwest kind of corner of town. This is an old uh, Christian science church that we've converted to a library. And this now houses our 35 core uh, in engineers and program managers like myself. Um, we also have an additional 100 employees kind of sprinkled around the globe um, and throughout the United States who are actively digitizing content. I head up the web archive side of our operations, and so I have just enough knowledge to be dangerous about some of the other areas of our operation. I've been with the archive since fall of 2006, but we're a pretty complex um, institution and we've been heavily uh, distributed in terms of our efforts, both from a data collection and access and a preservation perspective. So what I'm going to try to give you today is a little bit of background on our organization, a little bit of information about our collections, and then also try to highlight some of the uh, decisions we've made around preservation and access. Um, so one of our, our fundamental tenets as, as an organization is really that access and preservation go hand in hand. And I had a very interesting conversation over lunch with Jeff Rothenberg, who gave the keynote this morning. And I think he highlighted a lot of the critical issues that organizations that are trying to engage actively in digital preservation over long periods of time are, are facing. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we're, we're called the Internet Archive, but we're actually a public digital library. Um, we're actually officiated by the state of California as a, a library that exists almost entirely in digital format. Some of you may have read in, in recent press that we're now getting involved in acquisition of physical collections. Um, that actually isn't a new development. We've also had physical collections uh, since our inception back in 1996. We've just tried to formalize some of the programs around that. Um, if you have questions about some of those initiatives, I will, I will attempt to answer them, although I'm, I'm less familiar with uh, some of the uh, technologies and innovations happening on the, on the physical archive side. Um, it, to give you a sense of our collections, because they're so diverse in nature, we often talk about what percentage of our collections or how much of our data is publicly accessible. Currently, we have about seven petabytes of compressed data that's publicly accessible. Um, I would guess that now we have something in the neighborhood of five petabytes um, of original uh, material that is not yet publicly available. And that, has to do with the type of material, um, but also has to do with differing embargo windows for materials that are contributed to us. And sometimes at uh, the request of the contributors, we have uh, different windows of time under which we need to keep materials uh, dark until we can make them publicly available. In our collections, we have texts, we have film, we have video, we have audio, images, software, of course, um, a lot of online educational content that's been used to facilitate uh, mostly university level education globally. Um, but then we also have a, a tremendous collection of web data and resources that have been uh, both contributed by third parties and then collected by the archive over time. Now, one of the things I, I like to try to put into perspective, and this was a, a quote that was published by uh, IDC back in um, May of 2010, so it's a little outdated, but it gives you a sense of just how much digital content is out there and being generated. Um, for the average person, trying to quantify that becomes difficult, and, and I liked uh, this reference that you know, the digital content is equivalent to all the information that could be stored on 75 billion Apple iPads. Um, you know, or that basically the amount of data that's being generated by everyone in the world posting messages on Twitter, you know, would be equivalent to them posting constantly for a century. It starts to make it tangible to the public, sort of the dimension of the problem that all of us um, are, are facing. Whether we're trying to selectively um, uh, grab materials that are germane to our particular institutional missions and mandates, or we're grabbing representative samples of this material, uh, both are, are daunting tasks in terms of trying to do that effectively. 
Now, uh, George Lucas will, will beg our forgiveness. Um, this is uh, one of the slides that we like to include when we're talking about digital libraries because the premise here is that you've got a lot of material. You've got a lot of data. Where's the information? How do you actually make it accessible? How do you integrate it in meaningful ways to individuals who are trying to take advantage of those resources? And the tools and the layers that are involved in not only providing that quality level of access, um, you know, end up contributing to the preservation of that, that content over time. But it's extraordinarily difficult for any one institution to take on that task alone. International and national collaboration is fundamentally critical uh, to doing this successfully. Um, and there's actually a, a, a statistic that was published, um, again, it's probably 18 months old now, by Google, um, around sort of the, the percentage of material that's now um, digitized in terms of unique titles. And that's about 12 to 14 of the 130 plus million texts. So part of our operations is, is not just wor uh, working in sort of the born digital side, um, which is my uh, domain, but also in, in digitizing material. And this just summarizes sort of how we tend to partner with institutions that are interested in digitizing content. There's a lot of selection that goes into which um, titles are, are pulled from the shelves. And then there's a, a fairly detailed process by which they're photographed and uh, gone through quality assurance all the way through to uh, sitting on, on servers and in uh, data centers. Now, in terms of access on, on the book side, um, a lot of our emphasis in the past three to four years has been on the Open Library Project. And there's two. Uh, key initiatives associated with that, trying to open up as much metadata as possible um, and develop linked data sets that can be contributed uh, on a global basis. Um, but secondly, also having a platform and a framework for supporting the concept of digital lending so that not only out of copyright materials but in copyright materials could be made available uh, to a uh, a user who wanted to come and check out a title for a period of time. In this case, we have a digital lending um, program that supports a, a two-week lending cycle. We have over 1,000 public libraries in the United States uh, that are contributing to this, in addition to uh, several institutions around the globe that have submitted digitized um, titles from their collections to the, the lending pool that are available for users logging into the system. And recently, we um, were able to uh, garner the support of all the public librarians of the US states to support the concept that their patrons within a state would have uh, unfettered access to sort of the uh, digital collections on, on a lending basis. So this is something that we're moving more and more toward of having shared collections distributed across institutions, but available to patrons um, to uh, permissioned uh, jurisdictions. Now, we still also take that full circle and make these titles available for print um, in uh, regions of the globe and, and quite frankly in parts of the United States where having a, a digital copy means nothing. You, ne you need a physical copy in order to facilitate uh, education and, and literacy in those communities. Um, so we, we do have um, initiatives that enable sort of mobile uh, printing of texts. And we're now down to a science where we can print a 300 page book in about 10 minutes. Um, and have that bound in a nice way that should persist if well cared for for a period of years. Um, this is just a, a couple of images of some of our, our book machines that we have on site uh, for printing on demand uh, from our digital library in San Francisco. Um, we're also heavily involved uh, in One Laptop Per Child and trying to make sure that our content is compatible with those distribution platforms and that um, what many uh, uh, individuals don't understand is that a lot of the, almost the entirety of the free content that's available for the Amazon Kindle, for example, comes from, from our digital library uh, collections. Um, so that's supported all the way through. Uh, we've also worked very hard with um, 
everything from software startups to uh, commercial entities to ensure uh, that it there's a seamless way to be able to uh, consume books uh, via a browser, not through sort of a dedicated device or a proprietary um, interface. Now, in terms of our text collections, um, we have uh, about a little over 3.2 million um, spanning a wide range of, of subjects. Um, one of the interesting thing about our collections is we have um, the largest collection of digitized Arabic material that's publicly accessible online. Um, we also have a wide range of um, uh, content from uh, Jewish studies also uh, available uh, through our collections. In terms of audio, we have a little over a million um, items that are available for either download or streaming. Um, as many of you are aware, there's very complicated issues with rights um, in the audio context. In general, uh, the way it works is we have bands that um, come to us and say, we'd like our fans to be able to exchange copies of our concert material online. And we also would either like to make copies of our portfolio available for download or for streaming. Um, the most uh, famous example, of course, is the Grateful Dead. Um, we stream all of their uh, content. Um, their fans, however, are available and um, able to exchange their own digital copies of those materials um, through this, uh, this initiative. In terms of moving images, um, we're now uh, exceeding about 690,000 um, films in over 100 collections. Two of the most famous are the uh, UCSF tobacco industry um, videos. If you're not familiar with those, um, during the whole debate on uh, the health effects of smoking um, amongst tobacco uh, companies in the United States, there was a great deal of recording of conversations that happened amongst executives and other members, scientists, um, around sort of the uh, process of trying to determine whether or not there was health risk or not. And this is all carefully archived and documented by UCSF. It was donated to them. We helped uh, them make it publicly available. In many cases, institutions may have profound collections, but they don't have the resources uh, to serve the content. And so we are uh, playing that role on their behalf. Um, we also work very closely with uh, Rick Prelinger, who heads the Prelinger Archive. He actually sits, he's the chairman of the board, of the Internet Archive. He has one of the largest collections of um, publicly uh, shot content. Now, he owns the rights to that material, but he's making um, much of his collections available in digital format uh, free of charge uh, to visitors to, uh, to our website. Now, um, what m you might not know is we've also uh, been maintaining a television archive since um, the mid-1990s. Um, we have over 1.5 million hours of television content. And we've started to release subsets of those collections to the public. Um, we did a uh, project in collaboration with a number of memory institutions in the United States around the 9-11 um, anniversary, including the 9-11 Museum in New York City. Um, we also have uh, been working diligently through open government initiatives in the United States to try to look at releasing uh, news content at different periods of time. So we're hoping to be able to expose more and more of these uh, collections. To give you a sense of sort of the scope, we have been uh, recording over 46 channels, 24 by 7, during that time period. And we recently increased that to, I believe, 70 channels now. And um, uh, I think we're up to 16 different languages in terms of the um, representation from around uh, the globe of, of news in particular. One of the other um, areas of our collections is actually, uh, we have image content. We worked um, early on with Hewlett Packard to try to assemble and create a repository um, that would reflect kind of best practice on imagery that was evolving as, as the web emerged. Um, but more recently, uh, we partnered with NASA when they didn't have the funding to try to create 
um, an aggregation point for all of sort of the image content that they had assembled in probably 16 or 18 different websites that were distributed throughout uh, their organization and also um, a lot of material that hadn't been digitized. So we worked on, on two fronts, trying to create um, one place where the imagery could be made ex uh, accessible to NASA employees and, uh, as well as the public. Um, the content is available free for download in a, a low res version. If you want a higher res version, you either have to contact NARA, uh, NASA, or um, uh, their representative image uh, organization that sells rights to higher res versions of the, of the images. Um, so that's a, a project that um, has been underway for three or four years now. On the website, which is um, uh, my Ballywick, um, we're now in the neighborhood of about 175 billion unique instances that are publicly accessible. Um, to give you a sense of the rate uh, that we're now acquiring new content, um, we're crawling about 50 terabytes of novel data on a weekly basis. That translates into about two and a half petabytes of new unique resources um, in any given year. We actively deduplicate, so when we visit um, a resource online, we check to see whether or not we've already got an exact duplicate um, the last time we, we visited. And this includes a, a wide range of um, approaches to collection. We have highly curated collections that are contributed by subject matter experts um, across a wide range of domains. We have um, election collections uh, that are very robust. We have um, uh, domain specific for most of the top level domains globally. Um, we also engage in what we call end of life uh, data sets. And um, recently, uh, we were happy to partner with the National Library of New Zealand, uh, who has agreed to help curate and take a copy um, of our web data for the GeoCities collection. Um, Yahoo contacted us when they plan to decommission uh, those sets of services and gave us actually six to nine months and as much information as they could supply around the scope of the content. The interesting thing about GeoCities is it was one of the first user-generated uh, communities and so actually no one had a definitive list of all the properties that technically were part of the GeoCities collections. So we worked very hard to try to pull together um, as much of, of the data as we knew existed uh, at the point in time that uh, that property was shuttered. In terms of the Wayback Machine, um, I know Mick wanted me to tell you a little bit about the background, but I'm not allowed to talk about the relationship to the cartoon. There is no relationship to the cartoon, um, except in so far as conceptually, uh, the Wayback Machine was designed to say, wow, if I could travel back in time, in theory, and experience something in the way that someone did in that point in time, um, wouldn't that be an ideal sort of approach to uh, preserving and accessing digital materials? So that was the original intent behind uh, the Wayback Machine. This is one of the more uh, recent interfaces. The same designer, uh, George Oates, who leads the Open Library Project, designed our television archives, our new interfaces for the Wayback Machine, and of course the, the Open Library pro uh, Projects. Um, any of you who have visited archive.org, you'll note that that uh, property looks like it did in 1997, so it, it really hasn't evolved. Um, but the intent behind the Wayback Machine is to try to enable browse-based access to individual resources and, and that you could actually click through on links and experience videos and images. What a lot of people don't understand, though, in order for us to make the maximum amount of content publicly available, we have to do live robots.txt. Uh, checks. So if you're not familiar with a robots.txt, basically any web publisher can put a little file on their server that's basically an instruction to either a crawler or other type of access provider that says this content cannot be collected or this content cannot be made accessible. And we literally have to go out. Every user request that comes into us, we have to go out and check with the current live publisher 
if that location still exists on the web and determine whether or not we can redisplay the content. So for many of you, I'm sure you've experienced this. You'll see missing images. You'll see videos that won't redisplay. Um, much of the multimedia content is actually restricted by a current website owner, even if they didn't own the website back in 1997 and you're trying to access that particular resource. So one of the challenges of being a digital library and having a patronage that is, is distributed, how do we balance kind of respect for copyright, respect for rights issues with the intent to try to maximize how much material is publicly accessible and available um, uh, to researchers and the, and the general public alike. So that's a little bit of the backdrop on, on the Wayback Machine. This is just a, a quick um, snapshot that summarizes how we kind of uh, achieve a degree of sustainability for our organization. As I mentioned, we're small not-for-profit um, based in the United States, but we have um, operating uh, income of about 10 million USD per year. And we really make every dollar stretch uh, to its last degree. But we cannot solely rely on grant funding uh, in order to uh, make us viable. So we offer services at cost to memory institutions that help offset our biggest um, costs, which are our people, um, our infrastructure, and our, our bandwidth. So we leverage that by providing, whether it be web archiving services like this one, the Archive It uh, subscription service, or the digitization services that I described earlier. Now, in terms of data storage and preservation, um, this strategy that we've, we've developed for managing our data is very specific to um, the, the uh, bucket of stuff that we're, we're trying to preserve. For example, in the case of all of our audio, video, software, image, content, etc., cetera, um, there are two replicas that are maintained within the Bay Area. One replica is uh, maintained in a data center in San Francisco. The second replica is actually maintained in a data center with the Internet Software Consortium based down in Redwood City, California. Um, we run audit routines on those files um, on a regular basis, usually uh, files that are not frequently accessed. We're visiting them every uh, 30 days, but certainly not less frequently than every um, uh, six months, um, trying to verify that, that there have been no issues or changes to just the stored data. Um, in general, we're supporting um, about 12 gigabits per second of data on an ongoing basis. Um, that uh, translates into about 2 million unique users per day and a heck of a lot of downloaded content. Um, so a lot of our collections are heavily accessed. Um, that's not as true for our web data set. As you can imagine, um, we have a lot of material spanning over 15 years, and the interest in different properties um, waxes and wanes depending upon what's happening in the news and elsewhere. So for our web collections, currently, again, we store um, two replicas locally, uh, but they're fairly distributed. You'll see a photograph here. We, we've engaged in kind of an innovative project with uh, Sun Microsystems, now Oracle, to look at container-based uh, data centers. This has been very successful in terms of reducing the cost to us from an uh, an electrical and cooling perspective. Um, what we didn't anticipate is that it's a really tiny straw. <laughs> the bandwidth in and out of that facility is very limited. So um, we have not been uh, successful at doing the data mining and innovative access services and programs that we'd hope to do on, on web data. We have about four petabytes of data uh, sitting in that container. Um, with our ability only to serve that onesie twosie uh, into the Wayback Machine. So we're hoping that at some point in the future we can remedy the bandwidth problem um, and move to kind of the next generation. In this slide you'll also see shots of our partners at the Library of Alexandrina in Egypt. Um, one of the fundamental risk factors that we identified to the preservation of our content was actually human error. <laughs> and I know many of you know the pains associated with this, but we intentionally wanted independent ownership management of the data set at every layer of the stack, different software, different hardware. <laughs> um, 
different routines in terms of their approach. Um, being in another part of the globe, now admittedly we picked a floodplain and we're in an earthquake zone, we didn't do so well in terms of those risks, but in terms of, of the partnership, it's, it's been a very successful one in, in terms of, of uh, exchanging data between institutions with the intent of, of long-term preservation in mind. Um, we've also done this on a smaller scale with other partners. I mentioned the National Library of New Zealand is taking a copy of the, Ge uh, the GeoCities data set. Uh, JISC in the UK has taken a replica of all of .UK uh, for higher education and research uh, there. We have partnered um, with institutions in Amsterdam. Um, all of our music collections are, are replicated there, all of our audio. Um, and we're working on partnerships um, that will deepen in Asia and South Pacific. Um, we're very interested in the idea of incubating not-for-profits where feasible. Um, we were happy to help uh, get involved with the Internet Memory Foundation's incubation in Europe. Um, these are the types of things that we believe are critically important, not only to our own success as an institution, but also uh, to the success of the, the broader community. Uh, just to give you a, a quick peek into some of our, our current um, infrastructure, uh, as many of you may or may not be aware, we're, we run really lean and mean. Um, uh, one of, uh, I had a great conversation with Jeff Rothenberg over lunch, but one of my um, confessions, if you will, was that um, the Internet Archive tends to make choices that a lot of other institutions can't make. Um, we use consumer grade uh, commodity components. Um, we do have a commercial entity that assembles all of our hardware and infrastructure. That rack that you're looking at is about a petabyte now um, of storage compressed. Um, it's highly energy efficient, which is critically important to us as an organization. One of our most significant costs of operation is actually electricity um, to both power and, and cool. Um, we've chosen to keep um, you know, two replicas on spinning drive um, in our local region. Um, sometimes we maintain additional replicas of special collections of content or for dedicated services um, to facilitate uh, access to um, facilitate uh, research and, and understanding characterization of, of the data itself. Um, these are things that we have to be able to have cost-effective storage in, in order to support. So this is a, a representation of our, our storage. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things that we've done to try to mitigate changes over time. Um, this is probably uh, comes as close to um, being involved in sort of migration of, of content as, as, as we get. Um, we're actually involved in, in two, on two fronts. Uh, the first is for all of our uh, video and audio clips. Um, we have an access file format that we standardize on. And I've been with the archive for about five and a half years. I think we've changed that format at least once a year. So we have all of the original source content unchanged. That is preserved in, in two online replicas locally, and then we try to distribute a replica to a third party for independent management. Then we have derivative formats that are used to facilitate access. And in the case of um, our audio and video content, um, we don't maintain all of the derivative file formats in the past that we've used to um, streamline access. When we replace content, we're really only maintaining um, two versions at a time. Um, in other areas of our collections, uh, they've just quite frankly been too large for us to uh, really experiment um, with at that scale. But what we have done, for example, in some of our smaller collections for our web data, um, we have adapted the Wayback software so that it accesses certain rules and routines based on the host resource that is being served. So we know how to modify scripts. We know how to call a different video format so that you can actually now um, experience a YouTube video from within a page. You won't be able to do that from archive.org, but if you go into the archive at service, we're now um, rolling that through all of the smaller, more focused web collections. So where we can innovate, we do. Um, uh, our biggest limitation is available resource and, and cost um, to uh, implement this. Um, another example um, on the software side, um, we have uh, fairly extensive 
extensive uh, collection there. We have about 50,000 physical titles that have been contributed by commercial entities. We have varying rules around when and how we're allowed to make that um, accessible. And then we have a lot, uh, a very um, substantial and growing collection of shareware. And we're using a lot of emul emulation techniques to try to make that uh, software accessible or to run as you would expect it to, as you might have experienced it in uh, the 80s or the 90s. So we're trying to partner with um, uh, other institutions around the globe to learn more about what they've done in these domains as we're just getting started in, in those areas. So that's um, just my introductory comments. I'm really hoping that some of you might have some questions. We can open up a broader dialogue. Hi there, Chris. I'm just really curious as to whether you can tell us how much your petabyte of uh, off-the-shelf storage um, cost. Um, <laughs> so it's depending upon um, how beefy we make it. So if you if we want to max the processing capacity, if we want to um, ensure that it has a great deal of RAM, because we we obviously are running audit routines and other processing on a on a local um, item level basis. Um, so if we max it out, it's about 125,000 USD. Um, if we keep it, you know, lower end, um, minimal RAM, minimal processing, it can be 80,000 USD. That's just the initial purchase price. That's not the lifetime cost of maintain, maintaining it. Um, and let me add this, because I know there's always interest about our hardware. Because we make choices to use um, commodity sort of consumer grade <laughs> components, um, they fail a lot more frequently. So we, as an organization, plan for data loss, not absolute data loss, but we assume that drives are going to be failing at a higher frequency than what you might be accustomed to with enterprise grade um, equipment. And as a result, we have a constant migration process and a set of very tightly defined procedures for what happens if we lose a drive. How does that um, uh, new pair get created from whichever of the pair didn't fail? Uh, it's gotten harder and harder as drives have become denser. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, when you're trying to create a new replica of three terabytes of data when it used to be 500 gigs, um, big difference in terms of time to uh, recreation of, of uh, those resources. And a, another data point, um, I don't know how frequently most of you within this room and within your institutions migrate your infrastructure, but we have had to migrate our infrastructure every two to three years. Um, we just could not afford the increased cost in physical um, square footage, uh, power, um, and uh, generally um, just the management uh, of equipment. So as we've taken advantage of um, advances in disk density and, and other innovations at the various hardware layers, um, we would, it's more cost effective for us to move all of our collections, ironically, than it is to, to stay on, on older equipment. Hi, Chris. Just wanted to um, talk a bit more. Oh, sorry, I seem to have stolen. Sorry, I have no idea where you are. It's I'm over here. Sorry. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, just interested in your points you're making there about the failure of hard drives. Um, uh, there was an interesting, there was a really good paper about four or five years ago from Google, who were certainly at that time and probably to date the biggest consumers of hard drives. Um, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of papers out there which cover things like mean time before failure and um, the the the. the uh, um, failure rates that you're finding. And I wonder if that's something you guys have actually put pen to paper on at all, or if it's something you would consider doing, given the volumes that you obviously get through. 
So I, it hasn't, it isn't something we've done historically. Um, I think with the small staff that we have covering all of the initiatives that I described to you, we really only have 35 people overseeing all of that work. So it's very difficult for us um, to be uh, prolific at actually publishing. That's one of our huge weaknesses as an institution. We, when we can get out and talk to people, we, we gladly share knowledge. We, we get involved in, in joint efforts, but actually putting something down on paper has been historically challenging. Um, it's a, it's a good concept, though, and there are a couple of initiatives that I think will come out um, of the television archive uh, work over the next couple of years. Um, the Arcadia Foundation in the United Kingdom um, recently funded our television archive group to do a more detailed study um, of uh, transferring material from you know, uh, tape, but also from offline disc to spinning drive and understanding sort of some of the issues with migration and then the maintenance of that collection over the course of a year. So there will be a final report generated on that process and I'm, I'm hopeful it will address some of the issues that you've, you've described. Um, just a short question. Uh, this project is huge. So I'm just wondering how many people are involved? Can you, can you hear me? I'm sorry, which project? Uh, your project, you're talking about the, the Internet Archive. It's a huge project. I'm just wondering how many people are involved. So the Internet Archive as a whole has 35 core employees, and then we have uh, about 100 employees that digitize materials. But there's really only 35 of us that have the technical skills and the wherewithal to implement these, these programs. All right. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Uh, Peter McKinney, National Library. Um, I wonder if you had any response to a comment from Jeff this morning in his presentation that Internet Archive isn't doing any digital preservation. So um, I, would, uh, I would agree with Jeff in the sense that um, how he outlined uh, sort of the important components of digital preservation. I would say that we do storage um, <laughs> really well. I would say that we um, are probably more expert than most in terms of trying to migrate from one generation of infrastructure to the next. But as, as Jeff pointed out, um, we've had the benefit of being on the same basic Intel <laughs> processing framework during that time frame. I shudder at the thought of having to actually migrate uh, between diverse <laughs> processing uh, foundations. Um, where I think we, we are maybe doing a little bit better than, than you might expect is uh, we do have audit routines. We do regular checks. We use um, you know, standard practice and procedures around um, at least trying to vet content that hasn't been accessed regularly. I know there are a lot of archives and libraries around the globe that if their materials aren't accessed, nobody's touched it for years. That's not true of, of our, our digital records. So um, we are at least attempting to bridge that gap. I think where we've been weakest, and I think every institution faces this, is there's a lack of consistency. As I described to you, we have different teams of people trying to shepherd these, these different corners of our, our organization. And so depending upon what resources we've been able to bring to bear at different points in time, there's a different level of rigor that's been applied um, to each of those collections. So for example, we've had no one overseeing software. Um, you know, there was a gap of like three years where our software collection was um, curated on, on a best efforts basis by you know, our, our main employees, but there was nobody's job it was to take care of that. Now we now have a, a few folks on staff who are really focusing on that and, and trying to, to make that collection um, more robust and, and certainly paying more attention to those issues. So I think that where we all fall down when our, our resources run short is, is we, we aren't necessarily consistent. There's you know, variability and there is that wishful thinking. It's like, well, you know, it, it, it survived that last migration. <laughs> um, you know, it'll probably survive this one. And that we need, we need to get past. And, and the question is, um, I don't believe that any one institution can do that on their own. We, we have to do it collaboratively because you know, the 35 of us can't be expert in all of the things that you know, um, many of the people in this room have 
you know, decades of experience interacting with. And we, you know, we all need to share sort of our knowledge with each other to make it possible to be more proactive in terms of digital preservation. Because I, I don't sadly foresee a time in the near future where we're going to have a lot more resources suddenly land in our laps. I mean, globally, we're all, you know, limited in our budgets we're all going to be facing the, the same challenges. We've got to figure out how to do as much as we can with what we have.